We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church family. Great to see you all here this morning. Uh, you can learn more about the Foster family. We have a little table out in the lobby area on your way out. You can learn more about that and get more information at our, our Go Wall about all of our Go adventures. Hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Matt. I serve here at ACC as the lead pastor, and uh, I would love to get a chance to meet you after services. Uh, you know, I, I want to just say that if this is your first time here with us, we're really glad that you're here. We really do count it an honor to have guests checking us out. This is a church made up of really imperfect people, um, and I assume that you're probably the same way, so really you're in good company. Uh, but you know, one of the things that sets us apart as a body of Christ is that we, we recognize that Jesus is the answer through our brokenness, and we've allowed Jesus to, to change us, and he's still doing a work in each of us, and we hope that if this is your first time here, um, that you would pick up on that, and that you would let Jesus continue to do a work in your life as well. Hey, we are, um, we are in the, the last Sunday of a series called Worlds Apart. And if you haven't uh, been here for the rest of it, just to give you a quick update, essentially we've been looking at different worldviews. Everybody in this world, everyone in this room, we all have a worldview. It's a way that we view the world around us. And we've been looking at some different types of worldviews, and we're seeing how important it is to get it right, right? To have a proper view of the world. In fact, you see in Colossians 2, this is all the way back from week one, right? It says, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must commit to follow him. This kind of seems silly, right? It's just basically saying those of you who have made a decision to follow Jesus, you know what you should do now? You should follow Jesus. That's what it's saying. But there's a problem that makes it difficult to follow Jesus in this way. It says, before it gets there, it says, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. But here's that warning. It says, don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Christ." So what this verse really highlights for each of us is that there are many different philosophies and ideas and ways to view the world out there. And for those of us who have made a decision to follow Christ, we want to make sure that we're allowing our roots to grow down into the, the fertile, solid foundation of a biblical worldview, on letting our roots grow into to Christ and who he says he is and who he says that we are, as opposed to taking our ideas about this world from all the philosophies and thinking of the world around us. So it's important that we get it right, all right? And one of the things we talked about on week one, as we were looking at the uh, different world religions, and then on week two, we talked about naturalism and nihilism, and last week we talked about postmodernism. But if you remember on week one, we, we shared a statistic, 31% of all the people in the world, you take a big pie graph, 31% of the people in the world, when asked about their religious affiliation, they will say that they are Christian, that their faith system is built around the person of Jesus Christ. Now, just so you know, that 31% makes up all the faith systems that have Jesus at the center. So you might have you know, Christi Protestant Christianity and Catholicism is in there, Jehovah's Witness, Mormonism, all those different faith systems are kind of in that 31%. It's only about 12% of the world's population claims to be Protestant Christianity, a Protestant in their understanding of Christianity. And of those, recent research shows that only 10% of that 12%, so about 1% to 3% of the world actually holds to a biblical worldview. 
In other words, 90% of the people who claim to be Christians don't actually have a worldview based on God's word. They don't have a biblical worldview. They have some other worldview. And I think that begs the question, what do those 90% of the people, and for most of us, you know what we do when we hear those people, right? We immediately think of other people. What do all those other people think? Not me. I'm one of the 10%, right? What do those other people actually believe? What is that other perspective of Christianity that people claim to be Christians, but they're not actually basing their, their worldview on, on Scripture, they're building it on something else. What is it? And we're going to talk about that today. It's this worldview that has a really kind of fancy name. It's called moralistic therapeutic deism. Sounds fancy, doesn't it? Will you say that with me? You ready? We can all sound fancy together. Moralistic therapeutic deism. We're going to explore what this is together. We're going to get our toes stepped on together. We're going to feel punched a little bit, spurred in a good direction together. And it's a good thing. Let's pray together. Father, right now I pray that you would poke and prod us anywhere that we need it. We want to be a church that, uh, that is made up of believers who not only claim to be Christian, but have built our lives around the truth of your word. God, in my own life and in the lives of this, this entire church body, would you show us what is off so that we can redirect it and get back on the track of, of being committed to following you the way you long to be followed? God, make us uncomfortable today where we need to be uncomfortable. Make us hurt where we need to hurt, but show us the truth and give us the courage to get things right. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I know that was kind of an unfair prayer because I prayed that on your behalf. I hope that your heart is in the same place, that you're saying, today, I want to be challenged. I want God to show me if there's something that's off. So let's ask the question, what is moralistic therapeutic deism? You know, the actual phrase was coined in a book. There's a guy named uh, Christian Smith, and he and a colleague, they did this huge survey uh, of, of people in, in America, and they asked, essentially, what do you believe about certain things? And they, what they realized, they, they end up writing a book called Soul Searching. And in the book, Soul Searching, they came up with a worldview that actually 90% of the, of the that, that, that most of the people in the world actually hang on to, which is moralistic therapeutic deism. Let's look at how they describe it, okay? Here's the first thing moralistic therapeutic deists would say, number one, that a God exists who created the world and watches over it. So far, that doesn't sound so bad, right? Everyone in this room is like, well, yeah, I believe that a God exists and that he created the world and that he watches over it. So far, it sounds decent. Number two, they would say that God wants me to be nice, fair, and I put in, in quotes here, loving, because so far, that sounds kind of good too, right? God wants us to be kind to people. That's in Scripture. He wants us to show love to others. That's in Scripture. But the problem here, one of the ways that this train kind of is already veering off track is a moralistic, therapeutic deist is willing to let the world define the word love. So we know we're supposed to be loving, but then we say, okay, world, what does love look like? I'll do that. As opposed to letting God define these terms. Essentially, what we really have here is just this big idea of we all just need to get along. Here's a third thing. A moralistic therapeutic deist would say the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about myself while I still can. Now, what you're going to notice in this view is that it's very much based on feelings, that, I, uh, that God loves me and he wants me to be happy and therefore he, wouldn't, he certainly wouldn't prohibit something that, makes, that brings happiness to my life. If I feel a certain way, well, certainly God in, in his in infinite knowledge has given me that feeling and I should hold on to it and run with it. It makes me who I am. You see, another problem with this statement too is this, this little bit on the end, while I still can, moralistic therapeutic deists, they tend to invest 
in this world like it's all that there is and forget that there's a much larger eternal one to come. Here's a fourth thing, is that God is available when I have a problem. God is available. He, he's out there, and when I need something, I can go to him about it. Now, I have something like that in my house that works kind of similar, right? If I need something in my home, a lot of the problems can be solved by simply saying, Alexa. <laughs> Anyone else? Right? Say, Alexa, send Roomba to the kitchen. Alexa, turn off the dining room lights. Alexa, make it colder in here. That'd be nice. Uh, you see, we treat God like that, as if he's some sort of a cosmic butler, that when we need something, we can just go to him, and, and otherwise he's not really that interested in what's going on in our day-to-day -day life. It's a little bit like, remember on whose line, or not whose line, um, who wants to be a millionaire? Remember the show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Uh, and there's that the person, he's there, and, or she's there, and they're answering questions. They get to a point where they don't know the answer, so they, they decide they're going to get help. They phone a friend. Well, when the phone answers, or when the person answers the phone, right, the friend's on the other end, and they don't quite know where they're at in the game. They don't know the question yet, so the contestant has to read the question, and the, the person's there, but it, it's kind of like the way we treat God. Like, hey, God, so here's the situation. As if God has somehow been absent, and we're able to go to him and just kind of bring him up to speed about what's going on in our life and just ask for help in that moment. And maybe he's got the answer for us. Maybe, maybe not. Or how about this fifth one, which is probably the scariest of them, is good people go to heaven when they die. Now listen, I've been in church long enough. I know most of you have been in church long enough. You know that when you hear that, you're like, ah, oh, I don't believe that. I know the right answer there. We know how broken we are, right? We know that the Bible says that no one is good. No, not one. That not a single one of us in this room is good. So we know not to put our name on that statement, that good people go to heaven. But there are a lot of actions and decisions we make on a daily basis that when you really boil down, in fact, let's just take all of these for just a moment. I bet that when you look at this list, you, you probably, as it, it's, it's done, all right? Here's, here's the five things. Some of you are thinking, I'm glad there's not a sixth one because you're like, whew, I guess I'm in the 10%. It's good. I'm not a moralistic, therapeutic deist. I feel sorry for the 90% of the people out there that are, but it's not me. But let me challenge you with this thought. Maybe God has you in this space today for a reason and that you need this message more than you think. Maybe if you take the decisions you make and the, the, the words that you say and the, the thoughts that you think and you put them all into a big pot and you boil it down, that when you look at the bones, what you got left is moralistic therapeutic deism. You're not able to see it yet. What I'm hoping today is that we can look at a few things, ask a few hard questions, and see are we actually moralistic therapeutic deists in some area of our life? And if we are, how do we fix it? We're going to be really scripture heavy on the back end of that because God's word has a solution for how to, how to get out of this mess. But first I want to explore these hard-hitting questions. You know, one of the, the hard truths, that book I mentioned, Soul Searching, which is where this moralistic therapeutic deism phrase comes from, one thing I wasn't really honest with you about is that book was actually a survey of American teenagers. When they first set out to write the book, they asked teenagers in America what it is that they believe. And then the book was written and saying our, our students, most of them are moralistic therapeutic deists. But what happened after that book was written and released, they decided to do a follow-up study asking the hard question of where are our young people learning this nonsense. And you know what that survey found? I hate to say this. It learned, that they found that these students learned this from their parents, their pastors, and their churches. 
This was a quote from that follow-up study. It's hard to read. It says, the problem does not seem to be that churches are teaching people badly, but that we are doing an exceedingly good job of teaching people what we really believe. You read stuff like that. You know, if, if, if you knew someone was about to punch you in the stomach, you would tense up a little bit, right? You'd get ready to take it. You'd ready to absorb it. Sometimes you read things in Scripture, you hear one of those quotes, and it's just like a, out of nowhere, it's just like a punch in the gut. You're like, oh, that hurts. Well, listen, I'm hoping that as a church today, you've, get, you've been given a warning, all right? Flex your gut this morning. You know, put on some steel-toed shoes. Actually, don't. I want us all to, to feel a little stepped on this morning, myself included, all right? I'm not writing this. When I was putting this together, I was not, at first, I'll be honest, at first I'm thinking, what is it that the church needs to hear? And as I'm writing it, I'm like, all right, I get it. I need to hear this. I, too, am part of the church and am very imperfect and One of the things God challenged me with as a pastor specifically was out of Colossians 1.25. Paul is speaking as a pastor of pastors and he says, God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. In other words, I feel obligated this morning to lead us through these questions and to say, listen, I don't really care all that much if you feel poked or prodded or hurt by some of the things I'm about to say Because God has given me a responsibility to serve this church by proclaiming the entirety of truth to you. I heard another pastor say it is pastoral cruelty not to tell the whole truth about sin. So, we look at those five things that were on the screen earlier, right? And we would all say, nope, that's not me, that's not me. Trying to figure out what are some questions we could ask to figure out if we actually are moralistic, therapeutic deists. And I've come up with two questions that I want to ask you to really challenge yourself, really ask some hard-hitting questions this morning. These are some, some test questions, if you will. Are you a moralistic, therapeutic deist? Here's the first one. Do you let yourself and the world define God's word. Now, obviously, there's the other side of that, which is that you let God and his word define you and the world. But for many of us, we actually go to the culture. We go to inside ourselves. We try to figure out what sounds good and looks right and what makes sense to us. We use our our naturalistic tendency to want to make sense of everything, and we go through Scripture with a very redacted perspective. We'll read a passage of Scripture, and it'll say something, right? And we'll go like, yeah, I get that. That makes sense. I could understand why God would want that. Yes, I'm going to apply that one to my life. Next verse, oh, oh, that doesn't seem right. I don't think God would want that for me. That doesn't make me feel happy. Either just redact it or read past it real quick. Don't mull on it. Definitely don't make any changes in my life based on it. And what we do is we let ourselves and the world around us define the words in God's word so that we read God's word from the world's perspective instead of from God's. Newsweek magazine said this, churches have developed a pick and choose Christianity in which individuals take what they want and pass over what, they, what doesn't fit their spiritual goals. What many have left behind is a pervasive sense of sin. It's really sad when Newsweek magazine has to point this out for us. If you think about the last few weeks, if we've been talking about other worldviews, you look at other major world religions, and you look at naturalism and nihilism, and you look at postmodernism, and you take all these ideas, and you kind of pick what makes sense from these different worldviews, and you smush them all together, and at the top you put the banner of, I believe that there's a God who created everything. And what you get on the other side is moralistic therapeutic deism. You've designed your own worldview based on what makes sense for you. What makes sense for me? Think about that for a moment. Do you pick and choose parts of the Bible that you apply to your life? There's other parts that make you uncomfortable, so you ignore those? 
you need to understand all things through natural processes and rational thought and science before you're willing to accept anything that doesn't, that maybe might require some faith? Do you feel like God's ultimate goal is to make you happy and that you, we don't offend anybody? Do you accept something if it makes sense to you, but skip it if it doesn't? And these are just some simple questions that we can recognize that for many of us, the way we read God's word is that we let the world define our understanding of God's word instead of letting God's word define our world. Hmm. Newsweek magazine came up with another article about 10 years later. This is an article called The Search for the Sacred. And they said, disguised in secular language of psychotherapy, the search for the sacred has turned sharply inward, a private quest. The goal over the last 40 years has been variously described as a peace of mind, a higher consciousness, personal transformation, or in its silliest incarnation, self-esteem. In this movement, many searching Americans flit from one tradition to the next, tasting now the nectar of this traditional wisdom, now of that, but like butterflies, they remain mostly in the air. You see, it's hard to read something like that and recognize that that is so unfortunately true of the way most people who claim to be Christians in this world, the way they live their lives. You see, a moralistic, therapeutic deist lets the culture define God's word instead of the other way around. Here's the next question. Are you a moralistic, therapeutic deist? Question number two. Do you treat this world like it's the real one? This is where I think most toes are going to get stepped on. Do you treat this world, you know, the one that you might get to enjoy for maybe 80, 90, 100 years, do you treat this one like it's the real one and neglect the actual forever home that God has planned for you? Or maybe even ignore and don't accept the fact that God has a desire to be in a relationship with you forever. Now, many of us would say, that's not me. I invest more in eternity than I do in this world. Well, I have some questions to challenge that perspective for just a moment. All right? If you don't want your toes stepped on, plug your ears. You know, you look at that, that fifth point of moralistic therapeutic deism, where it says, I, 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 it says that moralistic therapeutic deists believe that good people go to heaven. Most of us right now would say, I don't believe that good people go to heaven. I believe that only people who are saved through a faith in Jesus Christ go to heaven. Many of us in this room, most of us in this room would say that, but then we ask this hard question, when was the last time you shared your faith? Are you telling me that you really believe that if someone apart from a saving knowledge and relationship with Jesus Christ is gonna spend eternity in hell, you really believe that, but you haven't shared your faith in years? I don't know if you really believe that. How about this, do you prioritize daily time in social media, and yet neglect spending any time on a daily basis in God's Word. Starting to hurt a little bit, right? Oh, all right. Do you invest more money into your short earthly retirement than you do into eternity? If you were to open up your checkbook right now, would it say that you care more about what happens in this life than you do about what happens in the next one? How about this? Are you too busy to serve God's church as it seeks to fulfill the Great Commission? I can't tell you how many times people have said, man, I would serve. I'm just really busy. Too busy to to recognize that you're part of a body of Christ who is seeking to fulfill the great commission, working towards the eternal kingdom of God and towards the things that God has asked us to work on. But many of us, oh, I'm sorry, we're too busy focused 
on the 80 years we got here? How about this? Are you more grateful for the things you do have or ungrateful for the things you don't? This one is really challenging for me personally. A lot of these have been, by the way, but man, this one. Do you push your child to chase the American dream of success or encourage them to have open hands to follow a life surrender to God? When you think about the choices that your children are making, are you more excited and, and uh, putting all your energy into making sure they, they go to the right college and they get the good grades and they marry someone pretty and make pretty grandchildren and all these, these goals that we have and that one day they can retire and have more stuff than you had? Is that the ultimate goal you have for your children? Or do you just say, God, I don't really care about any of that. I just want them to fall madly in love with you and do whatever you want them to do with their lives. Maybe it has nothing to do with getting married. Maybe it has nothing to do with grandkids. Maybe it has nothing to do with college. Maybe it has nothing to do with great grades. Maybe God's calling them into something bigger and you don't care because you're more focused on this world than you are the next Do you spend more time on your child's batting swing or their pirouette or their whatever than you do on their discipleship? Do you spend more time making sure that they are going to excel in some hobby that they have as opposed to spending any time with them teaching them the hard truths about God's word? How about this? Does the world win every time there's a conflict between the world and church? Man, I wish I could come to church more, but soccer. How about this? Do you care more about what the people think of you than you do about what God thinks about you? Is your time filled with pursuits to make your name great instead of making God's name great? These are all tough questions, and it's, I could keep writing them. I was like, man, I've, I've probably already written too many, but these are just those questions that really help us examine, are we really living as if this world is the real one, or are we living like the one to come is where our focus ought to be? So with all that, I think we, we always wrap up our messages with a what now. And you might be thinking, we haven't even opened God's word yet. Listen, I'm going to put the what now question up on the screen now. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go into God's word and see what does God's word say about the correct answer to these questions. Before I do that, I want you all right now to look at your, you have a three-word prayer on the screen. I want to look at it, memorize it, bow your heads right where you are and ask God this question. I want you to say it instead of me. And when you're done, look up this way. We're going to open up God's word and we're going to examine what it is that we ought to do to live in alignment with the truth that God has given to us. Here's the first thing I want to challenge each of us to do. These are just answers to those two questions. Number one is to let God's word define your world. In other words, view the world through the lens of Scripture and not the other way around. In order to do this, one of the things that we need to see, if you have a Bible with you, I encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 12. But there's, there's a powerful verse in Romans 12 too that compares uh, these two ideas, all right? And it's the, this word you're going to see is the word copy, but it also is the word conform. And then there's also this word transform. So you're going to see the word conform and transform. Let's look at these, this verse together. Romans 12, 2. It says, don't copy. In other words, don't be conformed to the patterns of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You see, there's a big difference between these words. This word 
copy, you might have a copy of God's word that, that uses the word conform. And that's actually the Greek word, sus de metizo. And what it means, simply put, the uh, best simple definition of sus de metizo is it's basically to, to uh, acquire your shape based on the mold around you. If you want to make a jello mold that's in the shape of a star, right, you're just going to take a star mold and pour the jello into it. The liquid will find its corners and its boundaries. You put it in the fridge, and later on, you're going to have a star. That's conforming. It's letting the world tell you where your boundaries are and what you should believe and what you should do. It's the world giving you a mold and you kind of flowing into it and letting the world define you from the outside in. But what God's word here says is don't be conformed. Instead, it says be transformed. That's the, a Greek word metamorpho. And it, what it simply means is to be changed from the inside out instead of from the outside in. It's incredibly different. What you're simply saying is, I want to let God's word define me. I don't want to just flow into this mold. In fact, when you're conforming, what you're really doing is you're living life in neutral, and you're letting the world around you establish your boundaries. As opposed to saying, God, I want to let you transform me from the inside out. Now, you might be asking a question, why would I want to let God transform me? Why can't I just live in this world and let the world help me define myself? Why why should I do it this way? And if you just go back one verse, it gives us the why. In Romans 12, 1, it says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, and by the way, that and so, dear brothers and sisters, that's referring to Romans 1 through 11, Romans 1 through 11, you get this thing called the Romans Road, this incredible account of the fact that God loved you so much that because of your sin, and all of us are guilty of it, God sent his son to die on the cross in your place, and that by simply putting your faith in him, you can have a relationship with him forever in eternity. So that's Romans 1 through 11 in a nutshell, and now you get here, and therefore, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you because of that. To give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. You know, one of my favorite authors and pastors, a guy named Francis Chan. Are you guys familiar with Francis Chan? I heard a, a podcast of him. It might have been a sermon where he said something that was just so profound. He said, because of all that God did, has done for me, because he sent his son to die on the cross in my place and saved me from an eternity in hell and has given me a free gift of eternity with him in heaven. Because of that, if I open up God's word and it says that in order to worship him, I need to go stand in the middle of the road on my head, then I'm gonna go stand in the middle of the road on my head. It's just a simple, profound statement, which is because of all that God has done for us, the simple and easy answer in how we worship him is to open up his word and say, God, I want to conform my life to the way you've revealed for me to conform. Uh, to, I want to conform to your way of doing things instead of conforming to the way of the world. I want to be transformed. I know it sounds really simple, but it's simply this. As a follower of Jesus, we choose to follow Jesus. We choose to do what he says and to follow his plan and to let his word guide the way we view the world. Here's the second thing. Not only should we let God's word define our world, but we also need to prioritize our forever home over this temporary one. We need to ask those hard questions and say, where am I prioritizing this world over the next one? And what do I need to change? Colossians 3 says it this way. Since you have been raised to life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. And again, you'd ask yourself, why? Why should I do that? And you just keep reading one verse, Colossians 3.3. 3, it says, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. 
one thing I want to make sure everyone understands is these are two things that I'm challenging you to walk into. But these are two steps for a, a believer. Those of you who already claim to be a follower of Christ, these two things, letting God's word define your world and prioritizing your forever home over this temporary broken one, these are two things that those of you who have already made a decision to follow Christ, this would be your, your, your what nows. But in this room, I, I, without a doubt, a room this size with this many people, some of you just need to take the initial step of saying, God, I want to just be a follower of you and then trust him to teach you how to follow him. I mean, the stakes are incredibly high in Romans 8, verse 6. It says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. If you keep reading in verse 9, it says, but you, and I hope this is true for everyone in this room, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit. But then it goes on to say, if you have the Spirit of God living in you. It says, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. Listen, it is my prayer that there wouldn't be a single person in this room today that would say, you know what, I want to continue to live according to my flesh. I want to continue to live according to what makes sense to me. I want to continue to live in accordance with what I can make sense of in my brain. I want to continue to live with taking this and that and picking and choosing what, there's some good things in here, sure. I'll, I'll grab those things and hang on to them, but I'm not going to build my life on the truth of the revelation that God has given to us. And if that's you as a follower of Christ, can I just challenge you with a thought? I don't think you're actually following Christ. Remember last week we talked about the seeds falling on different soil. There are many people one day who are going to stand before God and say, Lord, Lord, it's me. And God's going to say, away from me, I never knew you. Man, I don't want there to be a single person in this church that one day standing before God, you think you had committed your life to doing things his way and the whole time you were pursuing the world's version of what it means to be a follower of Christ. So that's you. I just want to challenge you to think through that. If you want to give your life to Jesus for the first time today, come find me. Come find anybody with a lanyard on, a pastor at this church. We'd be happy to talk to you about that. Help guide you into some next steps you should take in your faith. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for stepping on our toes. Thank you for the pokes and the prods and the spurring that we need towards love and good deeds. Thank you for clearly defining what it means to be a follower of you in scripture, for this incredible revelation you've given to us called your word, that we get to, to take it and spend time in it and study it and read it and know it and teach it so we can mold our lives around it. We can be transformed from the inside out instead of letting the world tell us who you are and what love is and all those other things. God, we don't want to be conformed. We want to transform. Thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. Give us the courage to take the next steps, not to just sit on those thoughts today, but to do something about it. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m. Please remember this. You belong at ACC.